Today, we're going to be talking about applied artificial intelligence applications and future directions, and it'll be presented by Dr. Robert J. Steele. I will introduce Dr. Steele in just a moment after a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, here are the session pointers that we'll be following today. Uh, and, uh, first, we're going to, uh, in the agenda, we'll cover some session pointers, then uh, just a word about the presenter, the presentation by Dr. Steele. Following the presentation, we'll have time for questions and answers, and we'll take just as many as we possibly can. Then we'll briefly touch on the upcoming webinars through the rest of the spring, how to get a copy of the recording and the slides and a certificate of attendance. Session pointers. We'll answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation, but use the text chat at any point to type in your comments or questions as we go along. We will be monitoring those and come back to them at the end of the presentation. Again, text uh, is the way that we're going to use today, so um, that's the way we'll be communicating with you. Microphones and webcams are not being activated for this presentation. A link to the recording as well as to the slides will be sent to all registrants and available on our webinar webpage. Many people watch these uh, webinars on demand and whether you watch it live like you are right now or on demand, we will be happy to send you a participation certificate. I will let you know at the end of the presentation how to get a hold of that. Now. Let's talk about uh, uh, Dr. Robert Steele and uh, the Applied Artificial Intelligence presentation. Here's a little bit about Dr. Steele. He is Chair and Professor of Computer Science at Capital Technology University and the author of more than 140 peer-reviewed scholarly publications. His work has been commercialized and patented. He has expensive, uh, extensive experience partnering with industry in a wide variety of ways. Uh, his research interests include applied machine learning, mobile information systems, AI, and health informatics. Uh, he holds a PhD in computer science from Flinders University, which is based in Adelaide, uh, Australia, and also a double BS a degree in computer science and in math and computer science from the University of Adelaide. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Uh, Steele to you. If you'll give me a moment so that I can um, go ahead and give him remote control of um, this. And I will also stop sharing and he will uh, start sharing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Let me just bring up the screen. Okay, we can see we can see your slides. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as per the announcement, the the topic is going to be uh, applied artificial intelligence applications and future directions, and I will try to keep quite specifically to those uh, those topics. So. For this talk, you know, we have a fairly uh, wide ranging audience. Some are uh, researchers, some are earlier, far earlier in their, in their education. So what we're gonna do with this talk is combine some like big picture takeaway points that I think should resonate with, with all listeners. Um, and also delve a little bit into um, some more detail in relation to uh, innovations and in research in this space. So hopefully we strike a uh, a little bit of a balance here. Uh, so that will be the, the four, the four uh, aspects of the talk. Before getting into that, I, I, I'll um, just briefly mention a couple of slides, um, basically by way of introduction. So um, I've spoken about this particular slide on other occasions, but the key takeaway is uh, what we're experiencing is what could be a, a called a jobs boom uh, in artificial intelligence. And these are many of the most highly remunerated roles. And these are um, the roles which are going to drive a lot of innovation in, in the current economy. So uh, uh, anyone who's registered will receive a copy of the, the presentation slide so you can review, review these uh, jobs titles at, at your leisure, um, noting that all of these are uh, figures are, are, are drawn from current um, current uh, jobs aggregator data. 
Also, before getting into the, the talk proper, um, we just want to um, quickly run over some words here and some terms just so that everyone has the has the foundational foundational concepts here. Um, we hear a lot of the term artificial intelligence, we hear a lot of data mining, we hear all sorts of similar and overlapping terms, but this is a you know a, a field of knowledge breakdown of, of how they all relate to each other. I'm only going to spend about a minute or so on this, so it's a lot to digest. This would make an hour lecture in itself. But um, again, the, the broader field, which has been fairly impactful to say the least, computer science uh, is less than 70 years old. A few years after this uh, advent, um, the subfield of artificial intelligence was, was first introduced or at least first named um, with the goal of basically replicating or emulating human level intelligence. Um, so it's not that new, it's over 60 years old, I guess. Interestingly enough, um, what happened was that was found to be a, a very ambitious uh, research goal, as, as you might expect. Uh, that led to the, to the separation of this field into distinct subfields of its own. Uh, notably, machine learning and data mining, you hear a lot about that currently. Uh, computer vision, obviously uh, tackling uh, the equivalent of how people uh, process images and see natural language processing, how we uh, uh, process and interpret spoken language, or written language. Robotics, interesting, is also classified as a subfield of artificial intelligence. This deals with how to uh, have a physical uh, device or a robot that uh, you know, either can emulate a human or, or do other some other um, uh, physical movement and autonomous activity. Uh, and information retrieval, another interesting subfield here with, with its own subfields. Uh, this is probably considered the, the progenitor of, of the search engine technologies and search engine industry, which in itself has become important at this point. Um, going back up to machine learning, uh, probably at this point, the most significant of all of these subfields uh, fields of AI, um, we saw some sort of a, a renaissance in this space in the 2000s, 2010s. Uh, with, uh, with with the sub subfield of, of deep learning. Um, and we'll refer to that here and there uh, throughout. Uh, and also interestingly, um, the techniques that are coming out of machine learning are coming to um, basically supplant the traditional techniques of, that are, uh, have been created and used in various of these other, these other fields. Um, separately from how do we learn automatically, which is what artificial intelligence machine learning is about. Uh, we have a, a separate field, a subfield of CS altogether called, you know, the management of data. This means databases, relational, non-relational and so forth. So this is intertwined, but strictly speaking, separate. Okay, so that's a little bit of bookkeeping and hopefully uh, many of you are familiar with those terms um, and some may not. So this is a, a bold, first dot point uh, for any talk of what the future will look like. Um, so we're going to make a few short term predictions. So as per the name artificial intelligence, so the original goal of artificial intelligence dating back to 19, uh, 1956 is the idea of, of being able to actually uh, replicate uh, the equivalent of, of human intelligence. Sometimes this is called artificial general intelligence or AGI. Um, let me suggest, and a key theme in this talk, this is not where the impact currently is or where it is about to be. That may, may disappoint some listeners, it, it may not. Um, the, 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 the alternative is actually possibly even more rosy. So to kind of drive home this key conceptual point, I'm going to speak by analogy here, okay? So we're all familiar with powered flight, i.e. planes and other uh, flying craft. This might be considered a, a bio-inspired technology. That is, we, we saw birds, uh, we observed their wings, we noticed that they had an aerofoil-like nature, and we concluded that the, 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 the lift provided by the bird's wing and the aerofoil shape could be, um, uh, you know, 
borrowed for the purposes of, of human uh, powered flight. Um, the wings in the case of birds provide the thrust as well. Uh, we modified that and we have wings and we have a plane engine to provide the, the, the thrust, okay? So that's how powered flight came about. Uh, interestingly, it's a bio-inspired technology. I, I, I posed a somewhat humorous and um, rhetorical point here. So shortly after this, you know, breakthrough of, of following the inspiration from biology and being able to achieve powered flight, um, you know, birds were replaced and made redundant by planes. What I'm trying to suggest is that as we copied something that we saw in nature and learned from it, um, you could maybe extrapolate that the technology would then follow to, to, to follow that particular um, biological inspiration more closely to, to perfect what it is able to do more closely and, and possibly, um, you know, uh, be able to re replicate it exactly. So again, this is the, the conception of artificial and general intelligence and also one of the conceptions that drives a lot of the current mainstream discussion of artificial intelligence, um, that the AI will um, be able to uh, replicate exactly what we do, make us redundant, possibly in some sorts of, of roles. Um, so the answer to my rhetorical question is no. Um, after 1903, birds were not replaced. But shortly after 1903, we saw some pretty impressive applied results. For example, we, we have this, uh, this Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. Uh, this is many, many decades old at this point, uh, but a plane able to achieve Mac 3.3, 3.3 times the speed of sound. Uh, a decade or so later, we had a reusable space shuttle uh, that at least re-enters the atmosphere at Mac 25. Admittedly, it's actually a glider at that point. Uh, we have hypersonic, hypersonic missiles, also extremely uh, impressive in their capabilities and if you're watching the news we now have we are about to have a powered flight on mars in in the form of what is known as the mars ingenuity helicopter that's being delivered by the uh, the perseverance uh, rover so what what am i trying to uh you know explain with this analogy we went far beyond um what a bird could do. I think we could admit that these are far beyond a bird, but uh, this did not involve exactly trying to duplicate a bird uh, and, um, and and in some way, birds did not have, have, their, have their purpose. Um, in fact, maybe interestingly enough, the, the key point is that exactly replicating a bird and, and, and how it flies is an incredibly difficult task. Uh, even in current engineering, we really can't do that. Meanwhile, we can go to Mars, we can travel at Mach 20 in certain circumstances. Um, and what this analogy is trying to demonstrate is that the low hanging fruit will not be going from the current AI technologies to um, perfect replication of, of human intelligence, but with the, with the you know, bio-inspired computing technologies we already have, we're going to be able to move towards applied uses of these technologies that are already far superior to what humans can do, but not replacing humans. And hopefully that doesn't sound paradoxical. Um, here's the key point. AI is nevertheless at this point far beyond humans in capabilities in certain applied tasks, maybe as, maybe as far ahead as the space shuttle is to a bird, okay? Again, just a, an argument by analogy, just to really drive home this point. What that means is that um, maybe, uh, you know, exact duplication, exact duplication of human intelligence is not gonna happen anytime soon and, and, and maybe, maybe never will. Uh, but the same technologies uh, are going to be, can be used already to, to do some very, very impressive things. Um, 
another key point to extend this analogy is that, you know, while the ability to have lift uh, via the aerofoil uh, from the biologically inspired technology led to a whole uh, plethora of uh, technologies, planes, helicopters, gliders, uh, and all of their, you know, more um, excellent variations. Um, the current technologies that already exist for artificial intelligence are far more widely applicable than aerofoils. They're applicable actually into all domains, all industries, and, and possibly all, all knowledge in, in a broader sense, as long as, and this is a key point I'll talk about in this talk, as long as we have sufficient and appropriate data. So again, AI is already has far greater predictive powers than a human. And uh, I'll drive that home with a couple of research examples as we go through this talk. Um, uh, and those predictive powers at the moment are applied into an extensive set of areas, which I'll talk about. But at this point, they're relatively limited. Should I say not relatively limited compared with what they could extend to um, it is still very, very early days. So, uh, you know, really the thesis here is that we are going to see a, an applied artificial intelligence boom that will actually uh, play into all parts of the economy and society. Not necessarily an artificial intelligence boom, but an applied artificial intelligence boom. And as I suggest here, this is certainly a good time to um, to extend your your understanding of this area rather than join it in a, in a decade or so when when a lot of the uh, employment is, uh, is, is basically downstream of these, these innovations that are gonna, gonna roll out. And maybe a final point before I get on to specific applications, um, a final point of this analogy is that another reason that this particular um, wave at the moment can generate, um, I would say more innovation even than the previous powered flight revolution is that it has a significantly low lower barrier to entry. Um, a lot of innovation uh, flew uh, developed from this uh, previous uh, technological breakthrough. Um, there were still significant um, barriers to entry in terms of what you needed before you could contribute to, to, to innovations in that space. In the field of applied artificial intelligence, you really just need sophisticated knowledge, um, strong technical skills, and, uh, and I'm going to argue as well, a, a strong creativity is a particularly uh, creative area and some high powered computing does not go astray as well. Uh, and finally, how long will it last? I would expect at least one to two decades, possibly longer, depending on how this is going to play out. So that is the kind of the general thesis, uh, why I particularly call this talk applied artificial intelligence to really um, separate where I think the action is versus uh, AGI or artificial general intelligence. Um, and uh, from here, I want to try to elaborate and uh, explain a little bit more exactly what is happening here and what, what can happen. So you know, where is, uh, you know, where is, um, where are artificial intelligence technologies applicable currently? So a key point here is that we need types of data that are non-aggregated, non-summarized. Uh, and data warehouses, a particular type of large-scale storage sometimes provides that. Um, why do I stress that point? Because you will, you will notice that even in a lot of um, publicly available data, so-called open data, even the data submitted to the Kaggle website. I don't know if people have heard of Kaggle, but Kaggle is a kind of a, an open platform for competition in, in machine learning. Um, and, and sponsors of particular problems submit their, their data and then uh, you know, with some sort of task where they want people to show that they can do a good job at applying machine learning. Um, sometimes even that data is, is submitted that doesn't really um, conform to what is needed for machine learning. So an interesting you're an interesting, um, uh, I guess, error, uh, error there. Uh, why do we stress that it has to be non-aggregated? Because the way we have managed data in the previous decades, particularly deriving from statistical analysis, um, tends to lead us to aggregate data. 
we're interested in descriptive statistics. We're interested in means and uh, differences between um, descriptive metrics between different samples, between different zip codes, between um, different countries. Um, this is often the way we have looked at data and what we consider analysis of data. Unfortunately, that analysis of data is at odds. That type of paradigm of analysis of data is at odds with what we need for machine learning and artificial intelligence. What we need there is we need individual events or instances or objects um, described in as much detail as possible, uh, not summarized, not, not averaged. Um, particularly where these instances have a temporal dimension, this basically provides us the mechanism to predict the future um, in a certain, a certain problem domain. Um, and I'll elaborate that a little bit more with some examples. So let's have a look at you know, where we're seeing current success um, in terms of applications of applied artificial intelligence. Okay, so we'll, we'll list a, a number here and um, uh, I'll just first mention um, one called health and medical applications. Uh, that obviously does not do it justice. This area is so broad uh, and it has so many um, aspects to it that uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very lengthy tome in itself just to describe this. But interestingly, possibly, you know, 60% or 65% of all current published applications in relation to um, artificial intelligence are applying these technologies to health and medical problems. Okay, and that is a, not a, um, not a, comprehensively researched number, but based on observing 2020 and 21 uh, publication data, um, health and medical applications um, are very preponderant. And I will talk about one specific example of that coming up. Um, security is, is another um, fairly successful and fairly prevalent application to particular, um, you know, particularly focused on applications, one, malware detection, another one, intrusion detection. You know, normally, if I was in a uh, class setting here, I would ask everybody to confirm that they know what malware detection is and what intrusion detection is. Um, this will be obvious to many, but maybe not everyone has heard of that. Uh, malware detection is the academic term for detecting of malicious software, like viruses or other types of um, uh, malicious code. Okay, so what is what what's involved in malware detection? It means I've got an executable sitting on my hard drive. I want to know whether it's a virus or whether it's normal software uh, or, or benign software without running it. Okay, sounds simple. Sound difficult is potentially quite difficult. This is a very well suited problem to machine learning. Intrusion detection. Intrusion detection means basically network intrusion detection. Okay, so a focus on insecurity has been um, whether uh, there is uh, malicious uh, co connections uh, being made to your network to uh, infiltrate and exfiltrate data. Um, so again, this is not something that you can very easily do based on manual inspection nobody's sitting there watching the uh, the IP connections come into their network. Um, so this is another area where um, artificial intelligence and machine learning have been uh, considered in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, chemical compound property from chemical structure prediction. Okay, so this is a this is a completely different facet altogether, but this is receiving a lot of um, you know, a lot of attention uh, basically from looking at uh, a chemical um, uh, formula uh, predicting how, for example, it, it may be structured, how it may be uh, in the case of proteins, how they may fold. All of these things are quite, um, have quite important implications for um, biology and uh, chemistry and, and, and uh, pharmacology and so forth. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this particular area a lot. 
another uh, popular area that's already being well tackled in the community um, and industry. Education outcome prediction, what that means is predicting what will happen to a given student um, in, in the course of their studies or post their studies. Okay, so um, why is that a, a good problem for artificial intelligence? It, it meets this criteria that I mentioned before. You have data on a specific instance or example. Here the, the example or instance is a, for example, a student. Um, and then additionally, you have a nice temporal component. Uh, a student's, you know, complete high school, they enter in, uh, and do their first courses and they, they, they achieve certain outcomes and other events through their first year. Um, and then there's a progression along a timeline. Uh, this is very, very amenable um, to, to machine learning. Uh, beyond that, even life outcome prediction, this is, um, you know, this is uh, attracting certain types of attention. This one is one that's more challenged by, the, by appropriate data sets. Um, of course, finance related prediction. This is another giant area. It's not actually as large as health and medical applications by, by any means, at least in the public um, outputs of these types of applications. Um, I will also throw in there that finance and financial market predictions are a, a problematic area for the application of artificial intelligence. Again, I would normally ask, you know, why, why do people think that is? But um, or if they think that is the case. But the, a key reason is that the set of input factors that affect uh, a finance uh, uh, measurable uh, price or something like that are generally not, not, not very well constrained. Many things could affect those, uh, those outcomes. Uh, it could be news, it could be the breakout of war, it could be the breakout of a of a pandemic, some of these things are just not going to be predictable, and the range of possible input factors are, um, you know, potentially you know, fairly limitless. So, further under this topic of prediction from features, another popular area and frequent area currently is human activity recognition. What does that mean? For example, uh, based on the data collected from your smartphone to predict that you are walking or running or sitting or having a conversation or, or whatever the case may be. So this is a, an interesting uh, particular application it has received quite a amount of attention. Genotype to phenotype characteristics prediction. This is of course the, the link and uh, using the data sets related to genetic makeup or genotype and phenotype is, is, the, is, the, is the organism expressed by the genotype. The, in the case of a human, the, 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 the grown human, or um, in the case of other uh, life, it, it will obviously be the corresponding phenotype. Um, a lifespan prediction has already been, predict, uh, already been tackled, for example, based on just a blood test. Okay, so this would be a, a, another, um, uh, another fairly clear way that you can apply because you, you just have to know how long um, individuals uh, do live. So you, you have to get some labeled data for this and then you can um, use as inputs the results of, um, of blood deaths uh, some, some period uh, uh, earlier in their life. So there's obviously some, some details there to think about, but this has already been uh, worked upon and, and published and these uh, results are kind of interesting in itself. Um, another popular um, application, more industry oriented, a customer churn prediction, for example, uh, you know, when, when will customers leave? Another fairly suitable problem, website navigation prediction, spam detection, okay, so uh, a little bit like our, um, our email systems, uh, automatically conclude uh, quite often erroneously that certain things are spam and certain things are, are not spam. Uh, this is another you know, well-suited problem. Software defect prediction. Okay, 
this is an interesting interesting question meaning you know, meaning at the time that you've written the code the software um, the ability to predict whether it will um, demonstrate some defect at a, at a later time um, this is supported by certain types of data sets available a software maintainability prediction and credit default credit default of course is another famous application here um, so I've started off there with a, a couple of ranges of applications, which are um, you know, prediction from, from um, more discrete features. You know, some of the recent, um, some of the recent uh, developments in terms of artificial intelligence, particularly focused on um, how we can do uh, you know, image processing and um, uh, and stream processing uh, without having explicit features as it were okay we are just presented with a, a video we're just presented with an image okay so it's the AI techniques uh, in this space that are largely uh, largely central to autonomous vehicle applications uh, self-driving cars uh, basically they hinge on the ability to do real-time analysis of, of roadway imagery to detect uh, oncoming vehicles or um, pedestrians and so forth. Um, this, some of these systems are already deployed, but as you can imagine, this in itself is an extremely, extremely hard problem. Okay, if you remember that artificial intelligence works by learning from examples, um, you, you can appreciate that there are going to be some some experiences that an autonomous vehicle would encounter that is never going to be in its training set or not even obviously um, uh, interpretable based on its training set. So for example, you, you've trained the self-driving car based on, 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 on millions of miles of uh, traveling uh, along, along roadways and, and past uh, stop signs and past pedestrian crossings. Uh, you know, what happens if, if one day the, the vehicle is driving down the roadway, it's been snowing, uh, there happens to be smoke blowing across the road and then, you know, two pedestrians cross at the same time or a pedestrian and, a, and, and an animal. Um, there are certain scenarios that are going to be quite unique. Sometimes those, <clears throat> sometimes those unique scenarios will be the, will be the, critical, uh, the critical cases. Um, and the ability uh, for a system trained on historical examples to be able to um, correctly interpret those is, is going to be uh, is going to be interesting. No, it's going to be it's going to be challenged. It's already resulted in uh, challenging. It's going to, it's already resulted in certain um, critical outcomes there. Um, of course, facial recognition uh, also involves um, sophisticated uh, processing. Uh, technology largely based around uh, you know, deep learning at this point. Uh, medical diagnosis, um, we've seen that uh, you know, current AI technologies can interpret radiological imagery uh, as well or better than you know, trained um, medical experts in, in their area. Uh, same with, uh, you know, for example, eye imagery, uh, detecting uh, retinal changes and so forth. Uh, an interesting space where we're seeing a lot of activity at the moment is landslide prediction okay so how do we do that well this is based on 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 satellite imagery of a landscape and then um uh, and then you know landslides will occur at some point in time and and so that will then count as a as a labeled uh, landslide and being able to predict in advance is something that's which you, uh, attracting a little bit of intelligence, which will remain um, elusive, I would say. With that, uh, Bill, I will turn things over. I've run a little bit over time. Again, this is my email address for anyone with questions, and I'm also happy to take any questions in the chat that may, may emerge. I see there's a lot of chat messages there. Okay, I think what we'll do is uh, I'm going to revert back to my slides, if I may and um, move to the end of the presentation. And then what I'd like to do is uh, 
uh, officially release everybody. I, we always promise that we'll end this in an exactly an hour. We will do that, but we're going to stay on uh, with the permission of uh, our good doctor for a few more minutes to take the questions, but I'll go ahead and slide through a couple uh, ending things so that if people need to go, they can go ahead and go. Let me make sure I have my video on here. Okay. Now, I wanted to just mention that we have three more webinars coming up this spring, April 30th, which is just in two weeks, the future of education and technology and education with Hayden Land. Um, on May 21st, Friday, May 21st, construction safety advances, advancements with Dr. Linda Martin. And um, we take a departure from technology on June 18th, on Friday, June 18th, with how to identify your skills and communicate them effectively. And this is specifically designed on how to build your career by successfully identifying your technical skill set so that people looking to promote you or to hire you know exactly what they would be getting. Those are the three webinars coming up. And just so you know, as always, um, go to captechu.edu slash webinar hyphen series to learn more about each one of these or to register. I also want to mention that a copy of the slides and a link to the recording will be sent to all registrants today. Watch for an email. Uh, and uh, a certificate of completion is available. And in the email, we'll explain how to get that. Just simply reply to the email with your name that you want on the certificate. This is open to both people attending this live session and anyone who views it on demand. With that, that officially, officially ends our remarks. But as I said, we have many people who stayed on and who have questions. We're now going to return to those questions uh, but you may log out at any time. Let me get back to the slide that has um, the uh, email address for, whoop, went, went too many, the email address for Dr. Steele, so that if uh, you want to uh, carry on a conversation with him offline, you may do so. With that, let's go ahead and, and try to get as many of these questions as, as we can. And again, if your questions are answered or if you uh, just simply have run out of time, feel free to log out at any time we will stay on and answer a few more. Let's begin with George Lala's question, which is, are most dedicated AI systems basically still a combination of expert systems and neural nets? Well, I wouldn't say that they're, they're expert systems at this point. Um, you know, expert systems are more what we call uh, you know, symbolic machine learning. Um, really, we've seen a, a big move to statistical machine learning, which is certainly includes neural networks and um, many other sorts of examples, some of the models I mentioned in some of my uh, research students' work. So um, it's not expert systems, but it is some of the latest innovations are very neural network or advanced or deep neural network related. All right, thank you. Uh, Deandra asked a very different kind of question, but it's a very applicable one. Uh, should one remain studying computer science or choose a more specific major, such as machine learning engineer or data engineer? Well, this is a good question. Um, I actually put this question to our advisory board recently, our industry advisory board made up of um, representatives and hiring managers from Google, the, the Department of Defense Joint AI Center, um, uh, and, and other very senior individuals. They're of the view that it's actually better to have an AI focused um, computer science uh, master's curriculum. You know, I literally uh, discussed the question of whether we should have a, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning masters. What, what are the reasons? I think the reasons are the following that um, even the artificial intelligence techniques go hand in hand with strong technical skills, meaning coding and data management. Um, you know, strong data manipulation skills and other um, theoretical understanding. So um, it's actually a little bit hard and, and programs are weakened if you split off the AI into a, into a separate into a separate part. The other probably the other key point about that is that the something like an MS computer science, a computer science as a name has good broad applicability. It, it's highly recognized. I would say, uh, you know, MS machine learning or machine learning engineering would be great, but you have to remember that that is a little bit narrower. Uh, the breadth means you have more durability and more, more uh, you know, uh, length, 
length in, in, in the applicability of that degree into the future. Very narrow degree names can be problematic. All right, thank good you question. very much. It is a good question. Um, Eric asks, what are your views on AI developing code, detecting coding errors and the impact mm -hmm. to the future of coding? Right. Well, this is a this is a great question. Number one, um, you know, there's a, a a quote I believe even by a famous individual, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the uh, one of the founders of, of this deep learning movement, who, who would would posit that the future is going to be more about showing computers what to do rather than telling them what to do. So, what does that mean? By showing them what to do, it means as per the AI we're discussing, you just show that a lot of examples, you show it not just 10,000, you show it several million examples, and it learns um, like what is the program or function that you need. So what is that, where does that leave coders? Well, coding will remain, um, number one, that particular model is currently only applicable to certain types of programming tasks, certain types of learning tasks and the sorts of examples that we've talked about in the, in, in the application side. Um, additionally, uh, to play in the AI space at the moment, you have to have strong coding skills. It's not a, it's not a GUI pursuit, okay? And at the current period, it's those with the strong technical skills who are able to both secure the, the jobs in this space. And I believe that there'll be an evolving strong technical need uh, for for some for some decades, but it's true that AI is being you know I mentioned some examples there. Looked at the problem of uh, auto translation of of source code from one language to another. So there is innovations happening there. Um, I would uh, and, and and even innovations in the overall paradigm, as as I mentioned, you know, showing the computer to do what rather than telling it, i.e., programming it. Um, but that will be that will that will be a, an evolution that will take some time. But that's also a great question. Thank you. By the way, Karim mentions that uh, they have used in Scripten to convert C++ to JavaScript and it worked great. Okay, great. Um, okay, back to the question. Uh, this is an excellent question. Thomas asks, what sort of open source technologies are available those for those who want to start experimenting with AI? Well, the, you know, the best, um, you know, there's several languages that are, um, are most appropriate for, for AI at this point. They being Python, um, R, and, and probably Java as a third. So if you go down the Python route, first of all, you need to know some Python. <clears throat> Number two, to do basic um, machine learning or artificial intelligence, um, you should uh, gain a knowledge of something like scikit-learn. This is all open source. All of the Python infrastructure is open source, including the advanced project. Uh, and from there, um, you can go on to use such things as um, Keras, uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch. All of it's open source. And there's a lot of interesting packages building on that. And just a, kind of following up on that, it's all open source. That's the beauty of it. That's why, you know, a, a, a kind of a dinosaur of the analytics space called SAS, S-A-S, um, will we'll struggle to compete in this little space because in this in this important space because um, there's a very dynamic um, and growing community that are collaboratively extending the infrastructure. Again, why is a language like Python uh, popular in AI? Because it's got what we call like a network effect, a feedback effect. As more people use it and and uh, use those particular libraries and tools, they also innovate in those libraries and tools. And so it's like a snowball um, and a critical mass. But in the, the, the answer I gave in terms of there's some of the, the things to, to start to look at, um, with good understanding of those, you can already start to do some, some interesting things. Good question. Thank you. Uh, Matthew asks a bundle of questions. I'm just gonna select one in the interest of time to get everybody a chance to ask. He says, do you see limits on silicon, silicon computing and the AI ML colliding? Um, Possibly, possibly. Uh, here's, a, here's a key point. Um, a key point is that the latest generation of um, models, some of the really deep neural networks, are getting so complex and have so many billions of parameters that even training them uh, can drive up a million dollar electricity bill. So I mean, just to let that, let that sink in. We maybe train some machine learning models and maybe they take a week, 
but you know, we're talking about some of the most advanced models, you're actually facing a kind of a, uh, you know, a decreased return on investment. There is so much computation that has to be done uh, for so little increase in performance. Um, and that computation in the end, it has to be done on a computing machinery. And um, at, the at the base level, it actually generates an electricity bill. So there's actually, um, amongst other other costs. So, you know, there there is an interesting. Uh, this is an interesting uh, area, uh, and and in general, the general point is that um, there's a very interesting interconnection here between hardware capabilities and particularly things like graphical graphics processing units and um, and the speed of your 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 AI model uh, training. So. Um, Here's the other key point though, before you reach that, that upper limit, you will have been able to, uh, as I've described in my talk, uh, transform the predictive capability in, in many, many industries. So, you know, it's again like this idea that we, we, we can't go ahead until we can replicate human intelligence. Well, let's just put that one on the shelf for a moment. Just like, let's just put the, you know, the upper limit on the hardware on the shelf for the moment. Let's go back down to what we can do. And you'll find that what can be done in terms of prediction is already, again, as I mentioned, far beyond what any human can do, even the most expert human in their domains, given the right data and the right problem formulation, we can already beat humans for anything. Again, just as a historical point, before we started dealing with real world problems, we dealt with games, which are nice to constrain things. As you may know, I think the uh, world champion in chess was beaten in 1998, was it Kasparov or something like that? And then the, the, the world champion Go player was beaten some years later. And then by 2015, the uh, you know, the ability to recognize language was exceeded human human capabilities on certain benchmarks. So um, that's that's the bottom line is that it will not act as a practical barrier before many, many significant um, developments from this field are already um, up and running in industry, in my view. All right. I, I see even with the extension of the time, we are running out of time. I promise to keep this to 10 minutes. So we have just three. Well, I'm, happy, I'm happy to keep going, Bill. Uh, if anyone wants to hear the answers, I'm happy to keep going on my own here. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, I think you've answered this question, but I wanted to note it again. Uh, Idris had asked, do you what do you recommend a current high school senior about to graduate in two months do now in college to start preparing? Based on your answer before, I would say move into a computer science degree as as the good basis for all other that's, projects. That's, that's the best one. That's the best one. I also ran by our industry advisory board whether you whether we should create a BS in artificial intelligence, okay, a specific narrow degree. Of their view, uh, no. Interestingly enough, again, the reasons are that the, the, the skill the skill set the technologies for for ai machine learning are, are integrated with com other computer science skills you need to have and again the computer science degree has um broad recognition so you know if you're completing high school i would recommend that you start to uh hone up on your python if, you, if you're not already a you know, python expert um and then start to look into some of the technologies i mentioned uh, but um, in terms of formal education, uh, the correct pathway would be to go into a BS computer science. Potentially a BS in data science is an, another option um, that has a slightly more, uh, you know, a slightly less technical and a more business application orientation. Um, we could discuss what are the relative merits of that, but I can tell just looking, looking at the, 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 the career paths at the moment, you'll notice that the traditional term was called data scientist. That was considered number one job in the country. Well, now it's machine learning engineer or artificial intelligence engineer. This, and, and also these are high, more highly um, sought after. The reason being that it is actually the command of the high-end technologies, which is the premium skill to have. Um, so that's probably, if you, if it, if you are, you know, if you're a technical person and like to delve into computing uh, capabilities, and that's probably the, 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 the strength that you should play to. Here's a very interesting question. I, I've bounced ahead just a little bit, but because I, I personally find this question to be um, interesting because in May, we're going to do a webinar on the, uh, technological advancements in construction safety. And Todd's question is, what is the foreseeable future of AI in wearable safety technologies? Well, you know, wearable safety technologies, do you, what would be an example of a wearable safety technology? Do you mean like a, an alert that something uh, could 
would be about to occur. I'll let, if Todd is still with us, I'll let, let him go ahead and, and respond to that. Um, let me just put this point in that, you know, where you can apply AI is fully driven by data sets. And that's why some of the, you know, when you look at the long list of applications I mentioned, it didn't mention everything in the world, because some things are not very well serviced by the data set. Um, in terms of wearable safety equipment, it strikes you that that's going to be hard to have the data set. The, the data set has to show many examples of, of interactions where you are safe and a good number where you are not safe. As you can imagine, especially if people are not currently moving around with wearable safety equipment, that data may or may not be available. And this is the, the, the key point here. It's almost like a chicken and egg problem that if you can't generate the data set, you can't apply machine learning or artificial intelligence. So I, that's not a comprehensive answer, but I'm, I'm just, you know, at the 30,000 foot view, that's what I suspect. He does mention, um, and Todd, thank you for staying with us, uh, hazard prediction, manual labor intensive industries and so forth. Yeah, again, I think the answer remains, uh, it's, it's possible. It, it, you could certainly, you know, there's ne it's not the case that there's not some niche that where it works very nicely, but I'm just guessing that that is the, the challenge to apply it to that area, at least currently, at least currently. Um, I'm going to read AJ's question to, and not try to interpret it because I don't think I understand it, but I'm sure you do. Do you see future NLP research better leveraging prior probability in conditional dependencies more aggressively than many of the current NLP algorithms in use? Well, you know, there's a lot happening in, in NLP and um, uh, maybe, but I can tell you that things like uh, transformer architectures are currently the, um, like the reigning, the reigning champions in that space. And uh, I would imagine that evolving approaches based on that, this is what all of these large organizations like Facebook and, and Google and Amazon are, are concentrating on. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovation still to happen there. It's already getting to an outstanding level of performance in terms of NLP. You're seeing more success there in NLP than you are in um, computer vision processing. So um, that's that's the space that I'm su suggesting that you like to see the, the next interesting developments in terms of NLP, natural language processing, Bill. Okay, this will be the final question. And because I am running out of time, I know Dr. Steele has been very gracious with his time, but I, I have another appointment <laughs> coming up. Um, Dung asks this, I am interested in designing an L NLP deep learning model to extract information from clinical notes for my dissertation. Would you recommend transformer? How do deep learners, how does, how do deep learner learn is it by testing and then configuring, configuring parameters? Well, uh, Dung, one, Dung, I apologize if I butchered that question. I mean, one of the good things about these transformer architectures is that you can gain access to already trained models and then just apply them um, even to, to, your, to your data set or, or modify to your data set. Um, otherwise, these transformer architectures require very large training data sets, which I imagine no matter how big your EHR system and your clinical notes system is, um, you know, you're, you're probably not gonna have that available, but you can look into some of the, and you can email me about this as well, but you can look into some of the existing um, uh, uh, models that, that can actually be, that have already been pre-trained and can just be uh, just aligned or configured in relation to your particular uh, NLP problem. That is an excellent uh, final answer. And I like the segue where you said to, to go ahead and email you. I'd like to just mention again that it, if we did not get to your question or your comment, and there were a lot of them in here, uh, feel free to email Dr. Steele. He'll be very happy to answer it. And, and Todd, I'm very pleased to see that you're working on a, the 
uh, efficacy of safety wearables. That, that's, that'll be an intriguing dissertation topic. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the 35 people that have hung on here for these extra 10 or uh, 15 minutes. And uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to uh, send you a copy of the recording and the slides. That'll be done in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, thank you so much to our presenter, Dr. Steele, who more than generously has delivered of his time and expertise to uh, create this webinar. I'd like to thank him uh, specifically for that. All you know, right. Are you able well, to get a copy of the of the questions? I know we didn't get through all of them. But um, yes, that's a good point. I'll, I'll Before I log out, I'll make sure that I have all of those so that you can be prepared to answer them. Yeah. Thank okay. you again, everybody. It's been a pleasure. And with this, we are officially done and you may log out now at any time as you could have 15 minutes ago, I guess, but you, uh, we're really done at this point. We'll see you all later and you all have a good day. Thank you all.